Okay. I know I said I'd be doing part three of the Virtual Boy series this month, but when I discovered that this was Women's History Month, another project idea of mine came to the forefront, and I felt it was one that was worth covering. Back in the early days of uh, video game development, there were a lot of uh, programmers out there, mostly male, but you also had some female programmers there as well. Like their male counterparts, no one really knew their names. Names started to become available when a third party developer named Activision decided that the programmers should be recognized for their work, as opposed to Atari who believed that the corporate mindset believed that there was no difference between the programmer and the factory worker. That led to Activision being formed and quite a few names becoming known. There were still some companies that did not like uh, programmers' names being known. Sometimes they used uh, pseudonyms as well. This video, we're going to be looking at some of those female programmers that made marks, blazed trails, and just created some of the most compelling games any of us have ever played. Let's get started, shall we? Okay, first on the list, Carol Shaw. Some believe she was the first female game developer ever. Well, she was the first known. So, let's find out her story. Carol Shaw, born 1955 in Palo Alto, California, worked for Atari in 1978 to 1980. When hired, then Atari president Ray Kassar said, oh, at last we have a female game designer. She can do cosmetic color matching and interior decorating cartridges. Interests that Carol Shaw had no interest in pursuing. Growing up, she rather played with her brother's model railroad set instead of the dolls that she was expected to play with. Atari designers told her to do her own thing, and she did. With games like Polo, which was unreleased, 3D Tic-Tac-Toe, which became a staple of the Atari library, also a version of Video Checkers, but it would be at the company called Activision, where she would release her greatest creation to date. River Raid. Before arriving at Atari, Shaw attended the University of California, Berkeley. She graduated Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences. Eventually, she completed her Master's in Computer Sciences. One of her first releases was a prototype of Polo, which was to go along with a promotional tie-in tie to a Ralph Lauren cologne. However, the game fell through and did not take part in the uh, Cologne presentation. She would then go on to do a version of Video Checkers and a classic game called 3D Tic-Tac-Toe, which would be a staple in the Atari library. She would also co-op with Nick Turner for a coin-op version of Super Breakout. She would also collaborate with a programmer, Ed Log, for a version of Othello for the 2600. She was designated to be Atari's first female video game developer. She was not aware of any other game developers at Atari, especially as the home and the coin-op departments were kept separate, not to mention secret from one another. She also worked on the Atari Basic Reference Manual for Atari Home Computers and also the calculator application for the 
home computer diskette also for the Atari home computer system. But it would be at the company Activision where she would have her greatest success, a game called River Raid. The origins of Activision come from the Atari policy that programmers were not allowed to be recognized for their creation of the games. The corporate mindset of Atari at the time thought that there was no difference between the game designer and programmer and the factory worker that put the video games in the box for shipping. This compelled a lot of these Atari programmers to leave Atari and form the first third-party video game company, Activision. Eventually, they would be joined by other Atari programmers, one of them being Carol Shaw herself, who would go on to create this game you see before you, River Raid. She would also create Happy Trails, an Activision port for the Intellivision, which I may cover at a video down the road. She would then leave Activision around 1984 and go to work for Tandem Computers in 1990. She would retire from game development due to the success of River Raid in 1990. She is credited as the first female game developer, but others would follow suit. And now, what is said to be probably her best known and maybe finest uh, creation ever, River Raid. Activision logo works pretty straightforward. Yeah. Bad start. Yeah, you pretty much have to go into the shooting. And also, you collect the fuel tanks to get the levels up. You can shoot the fuel also, but you can try to yourself a fuel to fuel up. So, fuel up, also pick up the bridge, ships, choppers, and you also pick up some speed as you go. Definitely a fun game to play, and yeah, you blow up some bridge and the walls you you pretty much are limited to the river now well, the game's called river raid so we're gonna raid the river you also got jets flying over so yeah last something but also keep some on here and yeah i'll make sure you don't run into a jet while in the process so fuel fuel Last ships, the choppers, the jet as it passes. But also be careful. Something that may be a good thing at least to pick up a duel. May not. Well, not quite there. So 4400, not bad, but let's go one more try. This is a game you definitely love to pick up on. Carol Shaw knew what she was doing when she had made this game. And this was pretty much the game that made her name and made her career. Mostly because Activision wanted the developers to be recognized for their work. You take a look at the commercial for River Raid. Yeah, there's, that was not a good place to get the You take a look at the commercial for River Raid. It's really a fun Yep, run into a ship. But at the end of it, it mentions designed by Carol Shaw. Or Pitfall, the invention of David Crane, Mega Mania, Steve Cartwright. Quite a few of the Activision commercials made reference to the programmer's name. But it wasn't for Activision's policy of making sure that the designers were recognized. People may not have heard of Carol Shaw. They wouldn't be remembering her. Or maybe it just been um, hard enough to locate. Hard to find. But this, this is one that you definitely go back to and enjoy. Just make sure you're flying right. Don't go into the wrong place, but also watch out for the ships. 
Also, stay on the river. Definitely stay on the river. The gameplay to River Raid is simple. Keep to the river. You blast targets in your path. Boats, bridges, jets, choppers, and sometimes even the fuel tanks. But watch out for the fuel tanks because you're going to need the fuel to stay in the game. If you run out of the fuel, you run out of lives. You're sent crashing down. This is definitely a game that I can keep coming back to. It's definitely a game I can avoid. It's fun, simple to play, but you still have to keep a, a sense of strategy about it. You may decide to go for a fuel tank in a far off corner and uh, decide, and find, well, find that maybe that was not the best idea. So strategy, reflexes, River Raid still knows how to keep you entertained and sharp as well. Who's next? I'm kind of hesitant to use this term. You've heard in terms of music, a one hit and a wonder. Someone that makes one song and is best known for that. Well, this could be described as creating a one-hit wonder. But what a hit it was. And uh, a creator in this game? A woman by the name of Donna Bailey. What's her creation? Centipede. <laughs> Donna Bailey, graduate of the University of Arkansas at Little Rock with a BA in psychology with three majors in English, math, and biology, who would go to work for Atari to co-create the second most selling arcade game of all time, Centipede. She was originally hired by General Motors as she was trained in assembly language programming for displays and micro-based processing crew systems. But when she listened to the song Space Invader by The Pretenders, she was inspired in the video games by the game Space Invaders. When she found the display she worked on with the Cadillac at GM was the same microprocessor used by Atari for its games, she left GM and made tracks for Sunnyvale, California to work at Atari. She was found to be the only woman to work in the coin op division. She had no knowledge of any other women in any other divisions, so she and Carol Shaw never crossed paths. She mentioned a notebook of possible game ideas, and she picked one with a short description of a bug winding down the screen. She thought it didn't seem bad to shoot a bug, as compared to other games which had lasering and frying things, according to uh, her descriptions. She would then work alongside Ed Logg as part of a uh, four-person team to help create the second most popular coin-op game, Centipede. Logg said he worked on the game's design, with Bailey doing about half the programming. Bailey would also contribute to the unique color palette for Centipede as she saw a technician work as regular colors change to a hot and vivid pastel color she had never seen before. before. Uh, she, to she told the designers to keep the uh, color design. Atari's production line would have to work two shifts to keep up demand. Centipede would have a strong female base as Donna Bailey and Ed Logg worked to have a broader audience of both male and female players. It's also a game that would be one that made use of trackball gameplay. She would try to make a game called Weather War, but that project would be left unfinished. She would leave the world of video games altogether in 1985 and go back to the University of Arkansas, where she would work to 
says for this and take care of her elderly parents. The Senate Bailey would be credited as software developer and software engineer. No other games uh, would match her success that she had with Centipede, but with this coin-operated game, she made quite the mark in the video gaming world and community as she helped bring a classic into arcades throughout the country, if not the world. Centipede may have been her one hit, but what a hit it was. Okay, game time, Centipede. The color graphics of Centipede. See that uh, Centipede coming down? Oh, and here it is. Uh, if you remember the movie Pixels, it really featured Centipede and also stick to the pattern. But also, make sure you don't... Ooh. Yeah, make sure you don't split it up in the wrong spot. Make sure you blast it in the right area. It's like if he's like squirreling down, it's like try to blast him bit by bit right there because you'd be in for a uh, real headache trying to uh, shoot it once it's so divided. Right now it's just one divided by one. Oh, now it's divided into several. But still, uh, it might be, yeah. Well, not here. I think the spider just got me. You basically shoot the centipede, centipede pieces, and it turns into a uh, mushroom. The mushrooms can also serve as a defense, but they can also be a bit of a hindrance in the process, too. Ooh, several of the centipede in a row, now you just gotta get four. And also watch out for the spiders, and the centipede comes faster, and so does the spider! But you also have a few other tricks that come your way. Ooh, that spider. And this is a very addicting game with the uh, shooting and also the obstacles that the mushrooms provide. Now, yeah, you can blast the mushrooms as well. And because sometimes they can protect, but sometimes they can also obstruct as you're trying to get at the centipede. And watch out for the spider and... Yeah, I'm dividing several pieces right there. And be careful. And just one more piece left. We got the spider, and it just says it changed colors. The color palette was said to be Donna Bailey's uh, well, the most notable contribution, but she also worked on the programming and the design of this game. Along with, uh, along with the uh, rest of the team and her partner in the development in the process. Oh, Spider, watch out for, uh, ooh, looks like he just, uh, just got hit. Uh, spider, keep tabs, because, the oh, flee! No, no, that's just part of the centipede, but yeah. Ooh, a worm, yeah. Worm crossing over, much like uh, the mystery ship on Space Invaders does. And yeah, here's the flea as it comes out. Ooh! Now that was sweet. It's just coming down, but <laughs> it comes straight at you, and you gotta get it before it gets you. But it can get you pretty fast. However, new life at 10,000. Careful about the worm. And ooh. Centipede's swirling down through the mushroom corridor. I wonder if uh, Mario is uh, looking for new mushrooms for the Mushroom Kingdom. Just, uh, maybe you better not ask, yeah, let him know where you got them. It's like, yeah, we blasted a centipede to get these mushrooms. Would uh, Princess Peach be interested? <laughs> this is Centipede, and yeah, looks like I got a bit of a high score here. Well, sweet game. You always try to make a sweet impression. Donna Bailey worked to bring forth a masterpiece in this game. With the color, the action, the enemies. This is truly a work of art. 
There have been different ports of Centipede on home consoles in the past, but nothing beats the original. Donna Bailey really made her mark with this game. She went on to different things, but Centipede was always her best and crowning achievement. It is challenging. It is fast-paced. It's colorful. Definitely that. And she was writing about her color palette choices. And we can always keep coming back to it. Next up, a designer, director, artist, even programmer, whose body of work is impressive. Rico Kodama. <laughs> Rico Kodama, game artist, director, producer, employed by the Sega Corporation from 1984 to her death in May 9th, 2022 at the age of 59. Best known for the Fantasy Star series, as well as the Alex Kidd series, especially Alex Kidd in Miracle World. She also worked in games like Skies of Arcadia and Seventh Dragon, where she excelled in the genre of the role player. She was also the uh, an artist on one of the classics of Sega, Sonic the Hedgehog. She also worked on a coin-operated game called Sega Ninja, originally titled Ninja Princess. And also, when it was released on the Sega Master System, it was changed so that the original heroine was now demoted to being a hero, as was revealed in the novel Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline. Rico Kodama had been known as Phoenix Re, having to take on the pseudonym as... Sega did not allow developers to use her to use their real names. This did not bother uh, Rico all that much as she was known as the first lady of RPGs, but she was also one who never cared for the spotlight as she credited credited her team for their work. She always felt she was part of the team and never really took any of the credit for herself even though her impact on games is clearly felt in the designs that are presented before us today. Her list of credits really do reflect as a who's who and a what's what of uh, video game titles, some way too numerous to mention. And some can be pretty thrilling in their own right, as given with the uh, clips of Sega Ninja you are seeing before you today. Rico Kodama clearly was an inspiration to many female game designers and developers, and continues to do so today, even after her passing. I could not find any details on, on the cause of death for Rico Kodama. No explanation was given. It was uh, clearly unlisted, so her cause of death, uh, as far as I know, remains a mystery. But her impact on the projects that she took part in clearly remains undefinable. As you look at a lot of the art, the art and the designs to the games she participated in, some deserving their own category, Rico Kodama is clearly a woman who left her mark on the game developing world. I became aware of Rico Kodama through Ernest Klein's book, Ready Player Two. 
She is basically the third female game developer I have come across in history. Carol Shaw being the first and Donna Bailey following afterwards. In reading uh, Ernest passage in Ernest Klein's book, it says, Sega Ninja? I remember this game now. I was addicted to it. You play this badass princess named Kurumi who has to take back her castle from the punks who usurped it. And guess what? When Sega ported, ported Ninja Princess to their Master System console, they retitled the game once again, this time as The Ninja. And because Sega thought it would improve sales, they changed the main character from a woman, the badass Ninja Princess Kurumi, to a man, a generic male ninja named Kazamaru. The Ninja Princess Kurumi was the very first heroine demoted to hero. Well, it's not going to be the ninja from the Master System we're covering. We're going to be covering Sega Ninja, also known as Ninja Princess. Starting out, Princess E's adventure starts. Going from a uh, Japanese princess to a warrior princess. Now, I have been sometimes stuck in this uh, spot for a while. Ooh, yeah. It's like, oh, shake your head, so. <laughs> I often find myself facing these uh, same four goons and just trying to find the best way to do deal with them, and sometimes I come up short. I lay up the shot, and on another shot, and then I get caught up in a tree. Game over. But, yeah, continue playing because you kind of want to try your hand at this game. You want to be able to get past at least these, uh, these four heavies. Yeah, right up close, got one, and got another. You guys wonder what's next? Like this guy. Yeah, there's a uh, goodie there. Unfortunately, that was too long on the screen for me to uh, get. And, and Ninja got me with a throwing star. White uh, Grub Ninja, and I have to face these four. Oh, he got me with a sword. Sometimes this does feel a little like... Uh, Going through Super Mario Brothers and you're still having trouble with those first two Goombas. Should we see what else there is? Uh, hold on a second. Well, one more go. Princess E's adventure starts. Artistically, this is a uh, pretty good game. You have a good design with the map ahead. Okay. Can we get through these uh, four? Yeah. Got through them. And, ooh, now that guy came out of nowhere. He was a surprise. Maybe something to do with the programming. And then you gotta face the, uh, not-so-fantastic foursome right there. But yeah, it's like, you get through these, it's like trying to get through them. It's like getting to the first two. Ooh, where did he come from? But regardless, he got me. Because... You start off with those first four in yeah, Sega Ninja in the uh, first uh, stage. And then it seemed like you went to the uh, White Mask Ninja next. Something in the programming uh, bring out a surprise threat that you wouldn't necessarily expect. A, uh, a fantastic fifth or and he got me. A map of the uh, map of the game level you're trying to get through. If you can ever uh, get past the uh, uh, Fant Four Stick Force. Yeah, nice little Fant Four Stick uh, referral right there. 
Okay. Princess E's adventure starts. Uh, how often do you really want me to see, see me doing the same thing over and over and over again? And just having same old, same old to show for it. Because sometimes the trees can be cover and sometimes they can be uh, an obstacle. And you're trying to think of some strategy and game can be on you and they, uh, lickety split. Ah, uh, there's the white ninja. Ooh, 2,000 points. You must have gotten a good shot right there. And he gets you right there. Game over. Let's see what else there is for a second. Hold on. Yeah, I don't think you want me to get, keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, even though I could talk about that. Ooh. Yeah, number five that came out and had some, uh, surprises there. Ninja got me here. Let's see what else there is. Okay, here we are with the gameplay where I actually got a little bit farther. Yes, take care of the first four. No surprise, number five. We got White Ninja there. Pick up his uh, goodie bag or his goodie. Oh, there is number five. So you are sneaking around. Uh, wait till the other guy. And, oh, here's some new. Uh, yep, there's some new warriors you'll. Have to face. I guess there's a new one every level. And got that one, but what about him? Ooh, got him. Ooh, white. Another white ninja. And, ooh, 1500. And, ooh, yeah, these three. Well, now it's three of them. But, uh, I guess these are three stooges of ninja. Pretty much a fun game, and I enjoyed uh, enjoyed trying to think on my feet, even though I came up short a lot of the time. Uh, this is a well designed, well thought out, and uh, fun and surprising game, which definitely keeps you coming back for more. I would recommend this game. Yeah, I'd love to play it again at some point in time. Further than the road. And game over for now. I openly admit I had a hard time figuring this game out. Uh, actually, just hard time getting out of the gate. Yes, you throw your throwing stars, but you have to throw it in the right position. And you have to be strategic in your throwing. And you can even find a extra goon that you might have missed before going on to your next batch of goons. This requires time. This requires patience. And hitting the reset switch quite a few times. Much like back in the day where you just kept putting quarters in a machine. That was always the goal of the machines when you're on the home consoles. It was the reset switch you always had to hit. And yeah. This is a game that's worth hitting the reset switch for. Have fun. Enjoy. And keep plowing ahead. And the last one on the list for today. Carla Meninsky. Harlan Meninsky started programming in high school and where she learned basic. She then went to work for the Atari Corporation where she developed games like Indy 500, Dodge em, and the 1980 point port of Warlords, the home game, which later went on to be a coin-op, Star Raiders, which was originally designed by Doug Newbar, and a port of Tetris that was never released for the 2600. She also took part in a 2600 uh, version of Battlezone, 
which has been released. When she started programming in high school, she learned BASIC and then grew into Fortran. Not deciding to let her laurels rest on those games, she earned herself a degree in psychology from Stanford. Psychology that she considered to be sexy and exciting. On an interesting note, Carly Maninsky came to Atari to do computer animation system. But since animation was tabled, she would go into game development instead. Ironically, the biggest claim to fame she had was the work on Indy 500 and Star Raiders, at least in my opinion, as those were games that made use of, well, in Indy 500's case, the driving controller, and in Star Raiders' case, the video touchpad. Only Indy 500 would incorporate the driving controller, and Star Raiders would be the only one that would make use of the video touchpad. I don't know if any other games were in planning stages for the use of these controllers, but none of them saw release, although the homebrew market has been making use of the driving controller whenever it can, whenever it can. and the touchpad has seen use in a homemade version of the synth cart, which allows musical composition on the Atari 2600. She then decided to become interested in intellectual property law as she graduated George Washington University Law School to practice in intellectual property law and financial litigation. She would then work for Electronic Arts after and then starting her own contract company. To my knowledge, she is still studying intellectual property law. She took part in the design, if not actually did design, games that made use of specialty controllers. Controllers where there was only one game made for. Indy 500, most notably, made use of the driving controllers. Star Raiders had a joystick and a video touchpad. These are games I would really like to revisit in the, in the not-too-distant future. But I still have to install a little something, as I have not yet worked on the 2600 Plus yet. However, it's also come to my attention that the 2600 Plus may not be workable with Indy 500 and or Star Raiders. So, at some point in time, special original equipment may be called into play. Because Star Raiders and Indy 500 are definitely games I will want to go more in depth in with original equipment or as close to original equipment as I can obtain. But for right now, let's take a look at a game where she made use of the joystick controllers. That game, Dodge em. A simple enough game for pretty much getting the dots, but also trying to avoid the crash car. This, I think, does the Ooh, yeah, and once you crash, uh, you pretty much uh, look like crumpled paper. But, definitely a good crash sound. Yep. As you build your skills up with this game, you'll find that another crash car can appear in the later levels, giving you more of a challenge. But you also have to be sure to... Yeah, I wanted to get over to the right, but... Yeah, wasn't in the right position. So, I keep trying again. This is one of those games that you do... Definitely one of 
of those and I keep hitting the reset switch games for. But also know uh, the best way to work the controllers. Otherwise, you'll yeah, you'll hit the uh, you'll hit the crash card like uh, like tissue paper. I remember playing this game a lot as a kid. It was uh, definitely a fun game. I used the joystick controllers uh, for it. That's how old school I was. I did not use the stick of controllers to play this one. And uh, I'd say probably with the joystick controllers, your uh, control might be more precise. But it's a simple enough uh, formula. Gather all the dots. Watch out for the crash car. And uh, as you get better, watch out for the other crash car. Pretty self-explanatory. But can I beat this first level? Well, let's watch and find out. Swerving okay. Nice little spot in the center. There's a spot on the difficulty switches, I believe, where crash car can stay on the outer rim like a circling shark. Go for a simpler approach. I thought I used that once when I was a kid, but I didn't use that approach here. Still, uh, tinker with the difficulty switches a bit. And, uh, once you play it and see what I get to... Ooh! Yes, I made it! I made it through that first level, but can I make it again? I'd say no, but fun game. In playing Dodgem, it's a simple enough game. You just have to clear the dots as you round the course four times. Four level course, gather up the dots, avoid the crash car, and the second crash car that can come later on. It is a fun, entertaining game, it has a two player mode, if you want to do two-player games as well, it's an alternating two-player. But still, good amount of fun. And also sharpens the skills while in the process. As I look back at the stories of these women, these innovative women who created games that are works of art, And may seem dated by some, but I think even now they still stand to the test of time. And I don't think these are the only stories out there. I think there are also other female developers, programmers, artists that have made their own contributions to this genre of video games. What are their stories? Time will tell as we find out more. Because the story of women in video game development, that's a story that's far from over. Don't forget to click and subscribe. What, you're still here? It's over. Go on to the next video. Go on. Well, before that, I guess I should let you know. Uh, that third part of the Virtual Boy uh, series. I'm going to be carrying that over to next month. The third part, which will have the special game. And then after that will be my May the 4th Be With You video. Now, it's over. Go on to the next video. 
Click on. Cool.